En esta charla, el doctor Rajit Ghani nos comparte varios ejemplos sobre lo que puede hacer la ciencia de datos, Machine Learning e Inteligencia Artificial para mejorar las condiciones de vida de las personas en nuestras comunidades. Thank you for, for, for the introduction and, and uh, uh, it's always good to be here. It's, Mexico City is, is one of my favorite cities in the world. It kind of, I grew up in Pakistan, so it kind of reminds me a little bit of home. It's just a cleaner, if you can believe it. So um, to get started, so this was the title I was given. Um, I saw on the agenda, like, okay, so here's my title. What can data science do for your city? And I started thinking, do I want to talk about what data science can do for your city? And I wasn't sure, so I started changing the scope. Well, there are all these buzzwords, right? So, um, right, they're all the same things. Um, now, I know some of you here probably work for a product vendor, technology vendor, and you have to say they're different because you have to sell something new. You can't keep selling the same thing. But they're all the same thing at some level. There's, you know, so, so that was the first change I wanted to make. It's not just about data science. There's all these different things that are kind of the same. The second thing I thought I want to change is data science, machine learning, AI, it doesn't do anything by itself. It just runs on a computer. Um, but it can help do things better. So that was the second thing. It doesn't do anything. It, it helps people like us. And, and that's important because if the people wanted to do horrible things, you can you do that. If you wanted to do good things, you can do that. But it puts the, the burden on the people. Then the next change I wanted to make is not just help the city, because we don't care, at least I don't care about a city. City is just buildings, roads, traffic, trash. It's the people who live, some people you know, care about other, other objects as well. Some people are tied to other things. But it's not about the city, it's about the people living in the city. Um, and so how can all these buzzwords, technologies, help with improving outcomes for the people living in your city, in your state, in your country. And I thought that seems like a reasonable thing to talk about. But when we think about sort of improving outcomes for the people, what type of outcomes and for which people? You know, people like us who can kind of be here uh, and have a lot of resources in life, or people who don't have a lot of resources and don't have access to things. Who do we want to help? You know, if you just say, I want to help people, well, you can only help the people who are really rich and who are doing really well, or you can help the people who don't have access to things. So I wanted to change this to using all these technologies, data science, machine learning, AI, to help with improving the equity, uh, the, the, the access and outcomes for the people who are living in your city. And that's sort of how I ended up kind of modifying from, from the title that was there to, to the title that I actually want to talk about. Um, because if you're building these types of systems, you need to know what you're trying to improve. Uh, and if you just sort of say, I want to improve everything, nothing will improve. If you want to say, I want to improve education, for whom? Uh, the people who are doing well or the people who don't have access to resources? You want to improve health care? Even for businesses, if you want to say, I want to improve my profit, well, at what cost? Who are you willing to help and who are you willing to hurt? And, and who, as a customer, you're willing to fire not, uh, because it improves your profit. But governments can't do that. They can't get rid of a customer uh, because, oh, you're too expensive to help, so I'm not going to help you because I care about my profit. Right? So the big difference in when you make public policy, we have to be very deliberate in deciding who we want to help, what type of people we care about, what changes we want to see, because that's what our systems are then designed to do. So what I want to do kind of the next few minutes is just give people examples of what I mean when I say, you know, these types of things, right? So let's sort of, I'll, I'll start with some projects that we've been working on. Uh, there are several people in the room who've been involved in those projects, so I'll point, you know, and then you can kind of talk to them as well afterwards. So this is a project that we started in the U.S. Uh, about seven years ago. And this was in the, the jail system in the U.S. is, is pretty bad. Uh, and it's bad for two big reasons. One is just the number of people that go through the jail system. So in a given year, and the way US is designed is there's jail and there's prison. They're, they're two different things. So jails are like local, city, and state, and prisons are a little larger. 11 million people in the US go into jail every year. The horrible part, are, part is this. Two thirds of those people have mental health problems, um, drug issues, substance abuse, all these health issues. 
And a large number of them, they get out and they come back in, and they get out and they come back in. And it, it happens because of all of these issues. Nobody's helping them with these, and that's why they keep going into the system. So we started working with, with some states or different counties on helping them figure out how do you use the resources you have? How do we decide, how do we help people by using these types of resources to help them with mental health in order to reduce that number? So that was the question they came to us. They said, look, we know there's a lot of people who keep going through the system, and we know that they need mental health, but we have very few resources. We can only help a few hundred people every month. Can you help us figure out who we focus on, who we prioritize, so that it reduces their risk of coming back to jail? And so we started working with them. We got data from them from different systems, from mental health, from jail, from police, from other things. We put it all together. And we built a system initially that was extremely accurate at predicting who's going to go to jail. Now, we could stop there and say, look, I can predict who's going to go to jail. And then I would watch them go to jail. Nothing will change. It will not help improve anything. And so the next piece was trying to figure out these people that we have identified, if we help them, if we gave them help in mental health, will they come back to jail or will it reduce their chances? So we started a, 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 a trial in 2019 to, we would give them a list of people, they go out and help them provide them services, and we would get the data back, and we would use that to figure out, is it reducing their risk of going back to jail? And it turns out so far we're finding it's reducing their risk of going back to jail, it's reducing the number of times they get arrested, it's increasing the number of times they seek mental health services. Um, so that's really encouraging. And based on that, what they've started doing, this county, is they've started extending the system to not just focus on jail, but really try to proactively help anybody who might be at risk of a mental health issue or suicide-related things or opioid overdose. So they can provide these services to people before they get one of these things. I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but today, later on, uh, Nuria will be talking about it, and so she'll give you more details about that project. So a, a different project, I'm going to go through other ones, but this was a project, again, we started a long time ago. This was in the US again, in Chicago. And one issue that's in many countries pretty common is um, lead poisoning. Lead is in paint. So all the paint that was made in, you know, in the 1970s has lead in there, which is horrible for, for kids. Um, and it's fine if it stays inside, but a building gets old and it sort of starts chipping. Kids crawl, pick up lead dust, put it in their mouth. And it's horrible. We, we, most of us know that it's bad. The way most of our, in the, in, so this was Chicago in the US, which is a pretty large city, but also other cities, the way they deal with it is they wait until it's, somebody gets lead poisoning, they test the kid, they find lead, they go and fix the home. But it's too late. Uh, you can't fix it once it's happened. So we work with them to help them figure out how can we predict when a child is two months old, three months old, before they can crawl, that they will have high chance of lead poisoning. And so they could go and prevent that from happening. They can remove the lead. Um, and, and that system, again, we ran a trial. It's implemented and being used in, 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 in Chicago. Um, here's another. This is a more recent example. This is a work we were, we were doing um, last summer. This is, again, in, in, in a city in the US in the east called Baltimore. And one of the problems that they have is they have a lot of homes that are connected together like this. And a lot of those homes have been, you know, people have left, and they have roof damage. Now, the problem with roof damage, there are two issues. Right? One is, if you're walking, you don't see the roof damage often. So any inspections that the city does, they don't see it very easily. Second is that if a house roof collapses, if it's a middle house, it affects everybody living next door. So initially, they found um, a, a partner which flies these planes and collects imagery um, from airplanes. It's not satellite because the light is not detailed enough. They're flying airplanes um, to, to, to collect this data. And they started do manually looking through each roof and saying, roof damage, roof damage, roof damage. And they realized that that was going to take them a very long time. Um, so we started working with them last summer to help them build a system that automatically takes that data from before that they've done manually and uses it to classify the extent of the roof damage. Is it high? Is it medium? Is it low? And they can then use that information to figure out where to go, where to prioritize inspections, how do we fix those things. So they've started to kind of use this, use this system over there as well. Another example from, from the US, and since the police there is, is, you know, the police everywhere is pretty bad in general. But the police in the US, you know, 
kills a lot of people. Uh, and one of the things we've been working on for the last several years, have been working with police departments to build systems that predict which police officer is likely to do something bad, shoot people, use force, and then provide that system to the police department so that it sends them an alert saying, this officer in the next six months is going to have a problem. Do something about it now. And some of those indicators, predictors, are obvious. They're not, they're not you know, they're, they've been doing these things before. Some of them are less obvious. We find if a police officer was sent to repeatedly to uh, incidents of suicide uh, or abuse of children, they become high risk of doing some of these things for a short period of time. And so the idea is can you now, if they've been doing that, can you give them something else uh, and try to prevent that? So that system is, is being used in several different police departments in the US. Um, this was a word we started in Mexico. We actually didn't finish, um, but I still wanted to talk about it. This was just before COVID happened. This was with the, with the Fundacion uh, Carlos Slim. And um, there's an electronic, you know, the vaccination card program that was started a few years back. And initially this work was focused in Guanajuato because their vaccination rates for kids were pretty low, about 40% um, for measles, polio, all of those things. And their idea was all these kids that are not getting vaccinated, can I, uh, they're not gonna get vaccinated in time. Can I identify which kids will not get vaccinated in time early so I can then figure out how to prioritize outreach, how to figure out where to send vaccination, vaccine supply. And we started this work in middle of 2019 in the summer, and, and then COVID happened. We had a system, we were, we were planning on, on testing it, and all of a sudden, all the vaccinators that they had who were vaccinating kids got moved and put on vaccinating for COVID. Uh, so that system never, never got used. Uh, but I still wanted to talk about it as an example of sort of how the same, same idea of this is an early warning, right? Telling this kid is not going to get vaccinated. Can I do something before? This is some work that we've been doing in the US for several uh, schools, but also we did some work um, in uh, El Salvador. Uh, and uh, the idea here was a lot of students who are in school may not come back next year. And if I can figure out early who will not come back to school, I can, I can start doing uh, some of these, you know, I can start sort of giving them programs, connecting with them. And uh, Adolfo, who's over here somewhere, he was involved in, in, in some of this. This is a more recent project. This is some, uh, so Carnegie Mellon is in the city of Pittsburgh, where, um, which is in the county of Allegheny. And this is some work we started doing there. And this is a problem of a lot, a lot of people who are in apartments or homes that are renting if they don't pay rent for a certain amount of time for different reasons, the person owning the house can, can evict them. And a lot of those people, once they get evicted, they end up homeless. And so this, the county there is trying to figure out how do we, we have limited amount of money to help people pay their rent in these emergency cases. Who do we prioritize? And today, they come in, um, people call, and whoever calls first gets in line and they get the money. That's not the best way to do it. So they came back and said, they asked us if we could help them figure out who, if they got evicted, will get homeless. And let's prioritize the people who will end up homeless. I'm not gonna talk about more, so we've been working with them. There is, uh, so Catalina, who's in the back, will be doing uh, a talk, more and more detail about the work that she's been doing on this. So you can ask her a lot more questions about, about this work. There are many other projects that we've done that are more around inspections of workplace safety, in Chile or in the US in San Jose of housing safety and other types of things. Uh, and then the last example I wanna give is some work we were doing in Indonesia, in Jakarta that we started, which was um, looking at traffic. So, you know, if you think traffic is bad in Mexico City, Jakarta is worse. I've been there several times and it is much, 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 much worse. Several thousand people die every year there because of traffic accidents uh, and and so the, 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 the city there thought, well, we don't know why these deaths are happening. We don't know what's the root cause of these accidents. And so what they decided was they put a few thousand traffic cameras to collect data to see why these accidents are, are, are happening. And a couple of years after that, they, they came to us and said, well, now we have a few hundred, a few thousand cameras for two years and we have video. We still don't know what's happening and why. Um, and so in this case, the question they were asking was not, can you predict when an accident is going to happen? Because predicting three seconds, five seconds, 30 seconds, or two minutes before, I can't do anything about it. Uh, what they wanted to know was, what are the root causes of those accidents so they can change 
things um, in the infrastructure to reduce those types of things. And so what they were looking for is really taking the videos and turning it into what they might call data. And they might call it data because it's in a, it's in a spreadsheet or a database, it's rows and columns. A video is also data, but we might not be able to connect it with other things. So what we did with them was use um, this, these videos and turn them into different types of events. So events like food cart vendor is moving in the middle of the street, or somebody is crossing the road, or a motorcycle is, is crossing you know, with lots of bags, and, and, and a car is going the other way, all things that you're probably very familiar with, things I'm familiar with as a, as a kid, you know, when I was growing up in, in Pakistan. But now if you take a standard computer vision system and you apply it to this problem, it doesn't work. It doesn't detect a food you know, person. It doesn't detect a motorcycle. Because in the US and in Western Europe, that's not what things look like. So when we apply some of these things, they don't really work. So you have to design the system for these needs um, and, and for the local, local context here. And so there are a lot of different, you know, I kind of gave you a lot of different examples. There are many, many more. They're all kind of, if you want to find out more details about some of these projects, there is, you know, and a lot of these projects, most of these projects, start off as summer program projects. That, that's one of the programs that we run. Find out, if you're interested more in how we do these projects, what types of projects we do, what we produce, find any of us and, and happy, to, happy to tell you more. Uh, and then you can also go to the website. So the reason for showing you all these examples was one, to kind of make things more concrete. Uh, and, and hopefully not to get you too bored talking about you know, something abstract. But the second thing was that there's sort of three things in common across all of these projects. One is that, which is what I started off with, is none of those things are making automated decisions. They're not just sitting and doing stuff by themselves. They're helping people do something better. They're helping somebody figure out which roofs have damage. They're helping somebody figure out which people to help and prevent them from going to jail. They're trying to help figure out which students to help um, so that they don't drop out of school, or which kids and which parents to focus on whose kids are not going to get vaccinated on time. They're not automatically doing things. They're helping a human do something better. The second thing they have in common, which is a really unfortunate setup, is all of these problems, we have limited resources. If we could help every child get vaccinated, we should do that. If we could help every student get access to resources to help them graduate, if we could get money to help every person who's getting evicted from their house uh, stay in their house, we should do that, but we don't. And while this is true, we have to make choices in who we help. This many people need help. We have resources to help this many people. How we pick this set matters a lot. And that's where this issue comes in, which is we have to choose who we help, right? If we care about efficiency, so if you can sort of define, and you'll hear a lot about efficiency from sort of businesses. We want to run an efficient business or a government. We want to run an efficient government. Well, efficiency means helping the most number of people with your limited resources. But if you design a system to be efficient, you're basically saying, I want to help as many people as possible. So then you help people who are easiest to help or who are cheapest to help. And you leave behind people who are much harder, much more expensive to help. And that leads to inequity. Uh, and disparities. So if that's what you, if efficiency is what you care about, you focus on a very different set of people. If equity is what you care about, not just the word, but actual outcome, then you choose a very different set of people. You don't just pick people who are easiest to help. Well, this student just needs a little bit of help. And there are all these students. I'm going to help all of them a little bit. And they do fine. And the people who needed more help, ah, that's too much work. They live too far away. They're too hard to get to. They need a lot of help. Not worth it. Let's not worry about it. Right? So this, this goal, this sort of choosing this is, is difficult, but it's extremely critical. We have to decide who we want to help and what we want to get out of these types of systems. And that's not a technical question. It's not a data question. It's not a technical question. It's a policy and societal value question. It's what do you care about in this society? Which world do you want to live in? And we spend a lot of time talking about these in all the projects with all the organizations that we work with. And sort of stepping back, right, we're going to talk all day with different sessions about machine learning, about AI, about data science. And you know, if you don't, if you're not sort of totally immersed in these things, if you take away one thing about the technology, it's this, right? Because it's that when you build these things, they're all heavily dependent on people like us who are developing them to make pretty much every little choice. They don't do anything by themselves. They're pretty stupid. 
Um, you have to tell them exactly what you want, and they do exactly that. Now, the problem is, it, often we don't think about, the people building these technologies, don't think about what we want them to do. They just like, ah, you got some code from here, I'm gonna build it, uh, and see what happens. And, and that's an important piece that kind of gets left out. The way I think about developing machine learning and AI systems is really starting off by what do we want it to do? What are, the, what are the values, what are the societal values, what are the policy values? Not what vendor you're going to use and what data you're going to use and, and how you're gonna build it and, and you know, what platform and what language and what are the values? And then you have to you build it to, to, to achieve the values, but then you test it. It all sounds very obvious, but that's not how most AI and machine learning systems are built. Most of them are built like, I have some data, I have some code, put it together, here's a model. Uh, does it do what you asked it to do? I don't know, what did you ask it to do? Typically, you ask it to do these three things. If you ask most people, why are they building the system? What do they want to get out of it? Oh, I want the most accurate system. I have no idea what accuracy means. Um, and we'll talk about it. Or I wanted to make profit, right? Okay, I, at what cost? What are you willing to lose in order to make that profit? Who are you willing to hurt or help? Or this is the most common one. I, I want to develop an AI system that helps me be more efficient. Um, and so while those are not horrible things, they're not the only things we care about. We might want to design systems that also do these things, um, that achieve fairness and equity, that, it, that are accountable to something, that are inclusive, that are transparent, that protect privacy and can be explained and understood. There's a larger set of values that if you sort of took any AI or machine learning toolkit today, you can define what accuracy might mean in that system, but you don't, you don't get an option to say, how much do you care about fairness? And how much do you care about transparency? You have to do it yourself. And I think that's, that's a problem today, right? And so a lot of the work that we're doing in those projects is really around developing these systems so that they can help get to fair and equitable outcomes. And there, it's not trivial. It's sort of you have to go through like, what do you mean by fair? What do you mean by equity? Which people do you care about? Uh, and that's difficult, and that's, it's, it's, you have to make choices. You have to say, I care more about these people than these people. That's very difficult to do for governments, because, oh, I care about everyone. And who do you want to help more? Oh, everyone. I want to make sure everybody has access of, to things. So you have resources to help everyone? Oh, no. So what do you do today? Do you help everyone? No, no, we don't help everyone. We only help these people. So you, 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 you can't help everyone today, so how are you picking them? Uh, I don't know. So a lot of governments are not picking these values. They're just doing things and hoping that it works out. And so we first spend a lot of time in defining what we mean. We have a lot of tools that we've built to measure the bias and the fairness in these types of systems. We then look at sort of what is causing it. We then spend a lot of time on designing algorithms that improve the fairness um, and then uh, and monitor and evaluate. And so I'm not going to go into detail, but I want to end with sort of one, one example that sort of shows you that trade-off that I was talking about. So this was an example we were doing in Los Angeles in, in the US, in California. And this is kind of similar to the first example I was giving on people coming back to jail. And there are a lot of people, again, who, who get arrested, they come in, they get released. The, the problem is that what they need is help uh, from social service programs. They need to get connected to other help. Instead, what they get is jail. And then they come out. And so the, the, the office over there in, in Los Angeles asked us for help in trying to figure out can you help us figure out, can you give us a list of 150 people that we can prioritize for coming up with what help they need and make connections for the help and so that if they get arrested, we can connect them with, with the help right away before and, and not put them in jail. And so we built the system for them. And the first system we built was, I want to build the most accurate system, right? Because that's what everybody wants to build. And accuracy in general in machine learning and AI, accuracy means replicating what humans have been doing before. You take ground truth, you call it, which is what humans did, and you say, I'm gonna replicate. So if you want to do what people have been doing, because people are not biased, and people are not racist, and people are not sexist, and you wanna replicate that, that's what we call accuracy in machine learning. Right? So we built the most accurate system, which was of the 150 people I give you, 73% of them will come back to jail. So of the resources you allocate, to make connections for people, you will be 73% efficient. That's, that's good. But here's what happens. Um, in this case, in Los Angeles, the recidivism rate, the rate of people come back, is much higher 
for Hispanic, for Latino people, and it's lower for white people. So the most accurate system we built is more accurate for white people because it was just looking at everybody and saying, how do I build the most accurate system? It ends up being more accurate for white people. It helps both groups, but it helps one group more. So they both go down, but one goes down faster, and it increases disparities. So you can say, well, it helps both, right? What's the problem? Well, it depends on what you care about. Do you want to help both equally? Do you want to help both? So, so that was number one. So then we built option number two, which we focused on what we call equality, which is it's going to be equal performing for both groups. Here's what happens. It starts from the same place, and it reduces both equally. So it doesn't make things worse. It doesn't increase disparities, but it also doesn't decrease disparities. It keeps the same world. It just lowers it for everyone. And it's slightly less efficient, slightly more costly. So then we designed option number three, which was designed to be more focused on equity and designed to be more accurate for this group than, than oh, sorry, for, for this group than, than for the white people. And it does the same thing. It helps more, it helps both people, but it helps one group more than the other. So it reduces the gap and gets to equity. And that's the and it was the same cost as this one. So that's the menu we presented to the government agency. Is if you want the most you know, accurate, efficient system, if you do that, here's what happens. If you're willing to kind of spend this much more, which is pretty minimal, you can get here. Now, there, in the background, there's a lot of you know, math and statistics and machine learning, all that buzzwords, but that's not how you talk about it to them, right? The, the menu is you can have this, you can have this, you can have this. And at that point, it was pretty obvious for them that this is what they want um, because the cost is pretty minimal and they chose to go with this, which is the right thing to do, but it required kind of giving them this menu and helping them figure out that just building a system that's accurate in the beginning, that's not the goal. If the goal is equity, you have to figure out how to design it. And we have actually found this in many, 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 many projects, is that we can get to this answer without very little cost. And that's a very surprising thing we're finding over and over again. And but also very encouraging, because now we can give this menu to governments saying, you don't lose anything. You're equally efficient, but you're much better on equity. But the main thing that we keep coming back to is what we find every single time is if you just build a machine learning AI system out of the box, if you use standard tools, it will be biased. Every single time, it is biased. But if you care about getting fairness and equity, you can design it so that you get equity without losing efficiency, without losing accuracy. And you just have to be, make sure that you, you design the system to do that. You can't just build it and say, oh, I built it. It's done. So you know, here's the kind of the summary, right? Is all of these different buzzwords, all these different technologies, they've given us ways to design things that are more personalized, right? They're, they're, they're not macro global policies, they're more micro. And they've traditionally been used to do things more efficiently, to do things what people used to do, but just faster and cheaper. But in a lot of these cases, we know people are not perfect. People have done pretty horrible things. Um, and, and so now the question is, can we put the two things together? Can we put these technologies and the people together um, and design them to lead to more equity? And not just making the system, I think some of us sort of when we work on these projects, we try to make the system fair. And it's not about the system being fair, it's about the outcome I mean, and when people who are using it. Because in many of these cases, the system outputs something, a user looks at it and ignores it, like, no, I, I, don't, I don't trust it. And the result doesn't change. In which case, who cares if the system is fair? because the people using it are not, not, it's not resulting in fair outcomes. And so that's kind of the main focus. And what we've been doing is kind of building a lot of these trainings, tools, so that you start from asking people, what are the values you care about? And then you build it so that it gets to the outcomes of, of, of that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that, there's a bunch of links here. If, if, you know, the, if this site, slides are on the website, you can kind of look at all the, a lot of different tools that we've built. Um, and yeah.